All right, let me have your attention, please. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, to you Carrie Elsie. And Carrie is uh, with our Educator Certification Division at TEA. Uh, she's uh, had a long time experience with, uh, with career and technical education. We kind of think of her as our go-to person when we've got questions about educator certification that, that relate around uh, CTE. So uh, you're going to find today that she is a wealth of knowledge and she's brought a team with her this morning to kind of uh, uh, work through some of this with you and I'm sure that they're going to fill you with uh, a great amount of information this morning. So Carrie, thank you for being here. Good morning, I'm glad to be here. Hello everyone, um, welcome from TEA and the certification division. I have been in certification for 30 years, which means I'm old as dirt, so if there's anything that has happened in certification, I've probably seen it or heard about it or whatever. I'm bringing with me our A-team today. Um, we have five lovely ladies here uh, who have been in certification for different amounts of time. I'd like to introduce them. A couple of them will also speak at, uh, after I have. Um, first over here to the right is Elza Romero, if you'll stand and wave. And we have Jennifer Pettis, uh, Marissa Barrera. <coughs> And Marissa's um, worked up our presentation today. Everybody kind of contributed to it, so we're, we're trying to move in a new direction and use the Prezi. We did the PowerPoint as a backup, so just in case, and a couple of our gals worked on that as well. I have Anna Armaro here, and then Judy Okamura, who um, worked with our school district teaching permit. She's going to speak at the end with some of those, and she's been at TEA several years. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, certification for the CTE areas. Um, we're going to give kind of an overview of the requirements and then talk about some of the changes that are coming forward in that area. So, um, as you know, CTE certificates are um, special classroom teaching certificates uh, designed for teaching those CTE courses, preparing students for very specific um, occupations. So we get a lot of teachers calling our office and saying, my district says I need a CTE certificate. We're like, okay, which one would you like? So uh, many times they'll come to us thinking that's the name of a certificate. And of course, there is no certificate called career and technical education. We have multiple different kinds of CTE certificates. There are kind of two general categories. There are those that require skill and experience and prior wage earning experience and possibly also a license. And then there are those that do not require um, skill and experience but require other types of things like academic preparation and testing. <coughs> So let's look first at those that do require prior work experience. That would be our health science, marketing, and trade and industrial education. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, for these areas, they all require some amount of prior wage earning experience. And that wage earning experience is detailed on a form called the Statement of Qualifications. How many of you have ever filled out an SOQ or looked at one for an employee? So you may be familiar with this form, it's on the TEA website in multiple places. So our first area, health science, this is a really booming area, we get lots and lots of calls, this almost seems like a shortage area at this point because we're getting so many people interested in this area. And as you know, if you know where the jobs are at right now, they are in health science with an aging population and all the healthcare industry booming, um, this is a very big route. Um, one of the changes that was made a few years ago was to drop the bachelor's degree requirement down to an associate's on the health science technology. This has actually kind of gone up and down over the years. We've gone back and forth with the degree uh, requirement. But because of the shortage in this area and the desire to bring in folks with, for, for instance, an LVN as opposed to an RN license, we dropped this a couple years ago for an associate's degree or higher. These folks must have a current license in the healthcare profession. We get a lot of questions about what licenses are required. We have at uh, some points had a list of licenses that were acceptable out on the website. We kind of took it down when we dropped this degree requirement because it put a different spin on the whole licensing aspect. <coughs> um, in addition to a current license, they do have to have two years of full-time wage earning experience in that occupation where that license was issued, so utilizing the license that they hold. If you have those two um, things, or those three things, you then have to get into a teacher program and complete an educator preparation program for this certification. In addition to that, like all of our educator preparation programs, it requires a one-year internship where you go in and teach in the schools 
usually on a probationary certificate, but sometimes on an emergency permit, teaching in your area of health science technology. Um, there are two exams for persons who are getting their very first certificate. These folks take the pedagogy and professional responsibilities test and then the appropriate health science test. We are in transition on our health science test, uh, going from an 8 through 12 to a 6 through 12, and you'll see the two numbers there. Um, as we're phasing out the 8 through 12 health science technology, which was test number 173, um, this is the last summer for that particular exam, so there's probably maybe one more administration on that test. For those <coughs> excuse me, who are in the pipeline for this particular older certificate, they have until next August 31st to complete all the rest of their requirements and then apply for their certification by October 30th. Um, something that you might be interested in, uh, just this past Friday, our State Board for Educator Certification Board met. Um, one of the items on their agenda, which was quite large, uh, in fact, was changes to Chapter 230. Um, there's a small section in Chapter 230 of the Administrative Code that talks about additional certification by exam. <clears throat> that law, that rule, allows a degree and certified teacher to add certain classroom teacher certificates by examination. Um, for a number of years, uh, we did not allow areas uh, such as the CTE where work experience and or licensure was involved. Um, back in about 2012, we opened that up to marketing to allow degree certified teachers with the marketing experience to add marketing uh, by exam if they had the prior work experience approved either by the school district or the uh, program. What's being proposed at this time is to allow um, individuals who are degreed and bachelor, bachelor's degree, so it wouldn't be appropriate for the associate degree person, but someone with a bachelor's degree, a current license in a healthcare um, profession, and the two years of wage earning experience to possibly add that area by exam. That is strictly in a proposed status right now. We're not sure exactly where it would go. Um, we've received a lot of feedback from the field indicating an interest in that area. We get a lot of teachers who have this background and started into another teaching certificate, uh, but then the school has a need for them to teach the health science technology classes. So that's, a, that's something that's kind of on the, the agenda for the next few months. Um, if it were to be adopted, we're probably not looking at until about maybe the spring before it could be implemented because there'll be technology changes in our office involved there. Our second area for, um, that requires skill experience and or licensing is the marketing, which I alluded to a minute ago. Um, the marketing certification does require a bachelor's degree and two years of wage earning experience in a marketing occupation. Now we normally think of that as sales of a service or product. Um, if you have the bachelor's degree and you've got your two years of um, sales experience, if you're an uncertified person, you would go into a teacher program and complete all the normal requirements for a teaching certificate through a program. And I must let you know that not all educator preparation programs offer these certificates, so a person has to be careful when they're looking at the different programs to make sure that the program they're enrolled in, that they're trying to get into, offers the certificate that they need because not all of them have the, the health science, the marketing, or whatever. So if they have these requirements, they go through their program. In addition to their program, they're going to be teaching again at least one year out there in the school districts, usually on a probationary certificate. And then they'll be completing their pedagogy test, which again is that PPR 160. It's the one that all other teachers take, the, the usual PPR test. And then one of the two marketing tests. Um, we're also in the process of transitioning on our marketing certificate, going from an 8 through 12 to a 6 through 12 certificate. So we have two tests out there currently. We have a similar deadline on the marketing 8 through 12 exam. For, so people who were in the pipeline or who had taken the marketing test 175, which is the 8 through 12, that last administration will be this summer and then they'll have one more year to complete their requirements, anything else they might lack, and then apply for certification no later than October 30th. So when we say um, that they have to apply and be recommended, these are folks who are in programs. So individuals who go through teacher programs have to apply online through our system, and then their program recommends them to the state for their certification. So here are our rules for additional certification by exam and marketing. Again, these have been placed, I think, since about 2012 or so. Um, you do have to have the bachelor's degree, a current valid Texas classroom teaching certificate. So that's kind of a natural course of things. We get a lot of teachers who have business certification and who have the marketing or sales background too. 
and many times the district has them teaching both business and marketing so you can see that sometimes it's kind of a natural combination um, they could be any other certificate though this could be someone with an elementary teaching certificate and as long as they have the two years of marketing experience or sales experience um, and there's no um, no limit in terms of how old your sales experience has to be here um, then you have the ability to add this by exam it does require that either an educator preparation program that offers the marketing certification approve your work experience via that SOQ or if the school district is willing and has a certified administrator that's familiar with this process and familiar with what to look for they can approve the SOQ and allow the person then to take the test and add that by um, the exam it's a little bit convoluted process it's pretty uh, technical there are a lot of instructions on the TEA website I recommend that if you have someone who's interested in this the district wants to help with that process then uh, probably best to call or at least read that information very carefully because there are a lot of details involved there in getting that to work and our favorite trade and industrial education this is the one that a lot of people think of <clears throat> when they think of a CTE certificate because it covers so many other occupations so health science covers the health science area marketing covers the marketing courses and then trade and industrial covers a lot of other occupational areas <laughs> anywhere from law enforcement to cosmetology auto repair different types of construction there's a lot of different things that fall under trade and industrial education and this is our one classroom teaching certificate to date that does not technically require a bachelor's degree aside from the health science technology now okay so this certificate can be awarded to someone who has a high school diploma or GED so you have two paths on the trade and industrial education and this has been in place for quite a number of years that a person who has the high school diploma or GED can pursue this certificate they must have five years of wage earning experience within the last 10 years and this 10-year recency is slightly expanded from our previous rules in fact this took place just May 15th so previous to this it was five years within the last eight on your work experience in your area and now it is five years within the last 10 so that helps some people that have a little bit older experience um, if you have um, the person who has the high school diploma or GED they have the five years of um, wage earning experience within the last 10 then they will also need to get into an educator preparation program so they are still going into an educator preparation program these might either be at the university level or they might be an alternative certification program we've got a lot of folks going in through alternative certification programs these days if you have a degree which could be either an associate or a bachelor's or higher then your wage earning experience is now two years within the last 10 that used to be three within the last eight so we've kind of expanded the the recency requirements on the on both paths and then we dropped the um, their degree or the wage generating experience to two from the person who has the degree so these are prerequisites these are non-negotiables on all of these certificates you must have your wage earning experience also in some of the professions that fall under trade and industrial education you might have a license certification or registration from an appropriate agency for your profession and that's going to vary depending on what type of profession you're coming from so if for example you were in law enforcement you would have some type of law enforcement um, license uh, we usually think of that in terms of someone who can either administer uh, enforce uh, the law someone along those lines a lot of people ask us do you have a list of who those people are uh, we do not have a list of those law enforcement licenses although sometimes I wish we did because we get a lot of questions in that area and a lot of people coming in from different aspects of the law enforcement profession so if your particular group your profession has a, a, um, a what is called the normal license or the expected license in that field then you're supposed to have that and it should be current in some cases a NOCT test the National Occupational Competency Testing Institute test is required and this is primarily required if your licensed profession does not have an exam for your license so if you had to pass a, a, a state licensing exam to get the license you hold then you would probably not be required to take the NOCT but if your profession does not have a normal licensing exam then you would probably have to do this these are determined at the level of the educator preparation program they let the person know whether or not they need to take that or not 
So meeting all of those prerequisites, the individual at that point must get into an educator preparation program, complete the program, and teach in that assignment for a year. So they, they're going to have a work approval area that's been determined via their SOQ, whether it's law enforcement or whether it's cosmetology or whatever it might be, uh, then they have to have that met. Um, in addition, and the last requirement is the fact that they have a very, very different pedagogy test and they do not have a content area to test like the health science and the marketing folks had. So we have a special trained industrial PPR test um, this one is also in transition. Um, this certificate has been an 8 through 12 certificate for the past several years, but it's moving to 6 through 12. In fact, um, the deadline is imminent for those persons who were in the pipeline for the 8 through 12 certification and who took that 170 PPR, which has not been offered for this last year. It was given for the last time um, back into 2015. So we're kind of down to the wire for people who have been completing the 8 through 12 program. Most of the folks who are currently in the pipeline or moving towards certification in this area have already moved over to the new 6 through 12 test in the 6 through 12 area. This would be a lot of people who are just kind of finishing out, kind of straggling through this last section of the 8 through 12. Now we've talked about a lot of deadlines here on these three certificates. And I want to make a point in terms of as we phase out certificates and we phase in new ones to, um, to align with new standards and, and to maybe expand the grade level on some of these certificates. Once you hold a standard certificate in one of these areas, it is yours to keep and renew. Just because we phase out a certificate, say an 8 through 12 trade and industrial, and, say, and you obtain that certificate, does not mean you lose your certificate. So once you earn a certificate, it's standard, it's yours to keep unless you do something that we want to take it away for. So as long as you get it hooked in on a standard certificate, you're good to go. Um, but we do get a lot of people questioning us when these deadlines come up. You know, I've got this certificate, I read the deadline, I hear you phasing out my certificate. Well, no, if you've got it, it's yours to keep and don't get alarmed about that. Alrighty, now I'd like to introduce to you Anna and she's going to go over uh, the certificates that do not require work experience. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Amaro. Today I will be speaking to you all about the four areas that do not require prior work experience. Um, we have agriculture, business, family and consumer sciences, and technology education. All four of these areas require a bachelor's degree. Um, also, initial certification requires an approved educator te um, Texas Educator Preparation Program. Um, you must also complete the required PPR test, the Pedagogy and Professional Responsibilities, EC through 12, and the Content Area Test, which we'll actually go over in the next few slides. Um, all four of these areas may be added by examination. The first one we're going to speak about is the agriculture. For the past several years, we have um, issued the Agriculture Science and Technology Certificate, grades 6 through 12. The last date um, for anybody seeking this certificate is going to be in the summer of 2016. You must complete all your requirements through your program by um, August 31st, 2017, and have the application submitted in the online recommendation from your program by October 30th, 2017. We have launched the, um, the new test, which is the Agriculture, Food, and Natural, Science, uh, Natural Resources, grades 6 through 12, and that was this past October of 2015. Next, we have business. Business is another area that we have issued the um, past several years. We have already launched this new business and finance 6 through 12, test 276, so y'all might see both of these um, tests in the, um, in the, through the Texas, or ETS, I should say. If anybody who is seeking the business education, the deadlines um, are the same as the other CTE areas, which is in the summer 2016 to receive the um, business education 6 through 12, test 176. Um, all your requirements through your program must be completed again through all, by August 31st, 2017. And um, you recommend your application online and the online recommendation by your program by um, October 30th, 2017. And again, the Business and Finance 6 through 12 Test 276 has launched. Our next one um, is Family and Consumer Sciences. Uh, this area does have three separate tests um, that you can test out in. 
The Family and Consumer Composite Test covers all the Family Consumer Science areas, um, and that's the Test 200. The other two areas, um, Hospitality, Nutrition, and Food and Science, and the Human Development Studies, um, basically just cover those general areas. Uh, at this time, we have no changes. However, if you are wanting to sign up for the test, it's going to be through a different association, the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences. And they, um, they're, they're a little different from ETS, which I'm sure y'all are all familiar with. Um, and they might have their own type of different fees to take these, these required tests. And last but not least is technology education. So as you know, this one was in the transition period where it's now the technology education. And um, at this time, we, we do not have any changes for the technology education. We like where it's at right now. Um, but we do have a lot of people who confuse the technology education with technology applications. And how I like to defer the two is technology applications apps. We all have our iPhones, our, our smartphones, and we, what do we do? We get apps on them. So it's like software, web design, um, kind of um, like Excel, Microsoft, things like that. So you're kind of designing, and a lot of people confuse that with technology education, which is, um, focuses more on engineering, arch architecture, and um, those type of concepts. Um, again, we do not have any changes at this time for this area. If you need to refer yourself, um, you can always go to the assignment rules, Chapter 231 in the Texas Administrative Code. Um, if you have any questions on what courses fall under these type of um, certificates, always refer yourself here. We do have the, um, the ruling available on the Texas Rulebook available on the TEA website. Um, and our division, the certification division, which we all are in, and our curriculum division work closely together to make sure that these rules are updated um, whenever new courses come in or there's courses that kind of get phased out or they're updated. So these are regularly reviewed and updated, so we work really hard to make sure we stay on top of things. Um, we, this next slide, will um, I'll have Carrie come and present it. It's more on emergency permits, so a school district can do that if someone's not assigned in a, a correct area. So I'll, I'll switch it over to Carrie. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> so when you do have an um, assignment that cannot be filled with a correctly certified teacher, uh, we do have available to uh, districts emergency permits. Uh, there are special rules for emergency permits and, and very uh, specific minimum requirements for those. Um, the individual does have to meet certain requirements in terms of prerequisites, if it's a degree level or it's work experience or, <clears throat> or a number of semester hours in the subject. Uh, they do have to meet those prerequisites and they have to be on track for certification. So if it's one of those areas we talked about at the beginning that requires skill and experience, that skill and experience is a non-negotiable. That has to be up front. You're not going to get any more of that while teaching the subject, right? Um, if you have a license that's required, that license is also required as a prerequisite for an emergency permit because you're not going to obtain licensure usually while you're working on that. All of that has to be up front on those areas that require skill and experience. So on your health science, your marketing, your trade and industrial, you have to have your work experience and or your license ahead of time and whatever degree requirement is appropriate for that certificate is all in hand. And so what would remain? The individual would either be going through a teacher ed program, if it's one that requires that, or in the case of those areas that Anna just covered that can be added by experience, such as agriculture or business, um, the individual is usually required to have 20, 24 semester hours in that subject to be on an emergency permit, and then a commitment to take and pass that exam within a year. So for those teachers who are degree and certified and they're going to be adding the area by exam, they get only one year to get their test passed, get certified, and move on. So this emergency permit is kind of a band-aid for people who are seeking certification, they're on route for certification, or they're already certified but not in the right area, and it allows the district to employ that person for a short amount of time while they obtain the correct teacher certification. So be aware that emergency permits are available to school districts. I know most districts don't like to use them and try to avoid those at all possible, but uh, they are still available when you have that emergency need. And so I'd now like to turn it over um, to Judy Okamura, 
Um, Judy has 10 years of experience with school district teaching permits and she'll differentiate between um, the emergency permits and the school district teaching permits. They sound a lot alike, but they're not exactly the same thing. Right, Judy? Right. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and take off my educator certification hat because this is definitely not part of that. School district teaching permits have actually been around since 1995. And what the thought behind it was is that it allowed districts to employ individuals who were experts in their field to come into the classroom, use their academic knowledge, their wage earning experience and occupational experience to teach students career professions. So an example would be someone who worked for NASA for 15 years or 20 years and they wanted to come in and teach math or physics why would you not want to have someone like that teach in your class? So it was a vehicle to allow the districts to employ them. Um, so it's been around. There's been a recent change this past legislative session and House Bill 2205. So it's been around a long time. It is not part of educator certification. It's um, a route, it actually is through the commissioner and he was granted the uh, authority to approve or deny these. Now the change last year is that for career and technical education courses that are non-core academic, the authority was transitioned from the commissioner to the local school district. So the districts go ahead and make the decision on whether or not a school district teaching permit should be approved. Um, <clears throat> so the change, again, is for that area, and what is a non-core career academic course? It's a career a CTE course that is not eligible for your core uh, science, math, social studies, or language arts graduation credit. And I want to stress eligible, because whether or not the districts choose to grant that a local credit, um, or graduation credit doesn't matter. What matters is, is that course eligible to receive the credit? Um, <clears throat> we have on our website a list, and it, it's kind of confusing, but basically there are so many career and technical education courses that are offered. As we mentioned, there's, you know, it could be automotive technology, it could be an architect, it could be law enforcement, it could be engineering. So rather than list every single course that's career and tech, um, it was just easier to state the ones that are uh, core career areas. So when you go to our website, there's a link for this list. If it's on that list, it's a core credit course, and it would not fall under the authority of the local district. Now who's eligible and who qualifies? Anyone who is a certified educator already, they're automatically not eligible for a school district teaching permit. And if you go to our website, we have it in greater detail about other disqualifying factors. So again, when you're thinking about the original thought of this, of experts in their field or people with occupational experience, you wouldn't want to consider someone who has tried to get certified and was unsuccessful in passing the certification exams, have exceeded their probationary or substandard certificates to be able to become certified educators. These are folks that the superintendent has the authority to qualify based on experience, academic, coursework, or a combination thereof. Strictly left up to the superintendent who qualifies them. It's the board of trustees that go aheads and makes that decision. Now the education code does require that they notify the commissioner of education. And we use, there's a form on our website, whether it's core or non-core, it's a one size fits all application or form <coughs> to submit directly to the school district teaching <coughs> permit email address. So unfortunately because um, it's outside of the certification rule or roles and rules, we have this email address. So any questions you have on this or to submit it, we take them only by email. 
So again, just to uh, go over this, it's not someone who's certified. We get a lot of questions about qualifications and courses. We have great folks um, in curriculum, and as it was mentioned, we kind of work closely together to make sure that these folks, if you have questions about qualifications and those areas in course credits, there are other divisions um, that can answer those questions. So when you choose, when your district chooses to go ahead and employ a, someone on a school district teaching permit, just bear in mind they're not, ed, they're not certified educators. And any decision that the school makes to employ this rests solely with the district because we have no authority to review or approve or even qualify. And we have a question here. Yes. I just want to make sure I understand. So if we have someone ever teaching on an SCTP, their course would only count as a local credit? We don't address credit because, no, I mean, curriculum can tell you. So it it gets very, we, we can't answer that question because it's outside of our purview. What we're doing is just recording. You're sending in the form. And the form is used because, um, you know, how many, we have teachers and they have to go through the background check. And school district teaching permit, because it's not certified, they're not certified educators, they kind of go around that and they kind of miss that. They fall in the gray area. So we want to make sure that for your district that these folks are fingerprinted and comply with that. So if anything should happen, the districts will be notified. So that's why that form is used. Does that answer whatever question? I know, and it may be curriculum that you'll have to talk to. Because, again, when you look at their courses, it's there's a ton of courses. Yes, Yes. Yeah, so when I, <clears throat> when I brought this up in our district, um, uh -huh. at, high, at high levels, I get pushback that it's not a way that we want to go. Is there, and I don't really see why not, is there some ammunition you can you can give me to say no, this is a absolutely valid way go for it hire 30 teachers or you know whatever you, you see what I'm saying that that's the it's it, the our administration feels like it's a less than way to bring a teacher in right um, and and it's it's true it's kind of like think of um, your child in that classroom why do we have certified teachers what are the ups and downs? I mean, you can have all the essential knowledge and skills. You can have the academics. We've all had teachers that are brilliant in their profession. They know their stuff. Are they good teachers? I don't know. That's why they go through educator preparation programs. That's not to say that those that are on career areas, because of occupational experience, that they wouldn't be I would suggest, and I can't really answer your question, that's a local decision, you know, decision, and I know there are a lot of districts that, that choose not to employ that. You'd have to ask your, your districts. And it depends on what they're teaching, like for automotive. I would just um, remind everyone that Anna had brought up the list of those that you can add by exam, and they're very broad, agriculture, business, um, consumer science. Why, you know, if they're already certified, it's two steps. Take the test, apply to get certified in it. Then there's no questions asked. Yes? We'll go back to uh, technical education. We have advertised now for a STEM teacher, which I know that uh, because our supervisors are going to be teaching engineering, mm -hmm. engineering courses. So to get to take a uh, uh, certification, what are the prerequisites for it? I mean, can it be a math teacher, a science teacher, or is that engineering? What is it that... Uh... This, and I may let Carrie do that, but there's that assignment chart on our website for educator certification that will help guide you on it. Um, so on your, your course is a STEM course? Well, it's going to be after the engineering, but they're uh -huh. advertising as a STEM teacher. Okay. So I think you have to be really careful, as she mentioned, and as Anna mentioned, to look at Chapter 231, which is your assignment rules, to see the exact name of the courses and what certification is required for those specific courses. Um, so the, the, in the CTE area, we get pretty specific about the names of courses and what certificates are appropriate. And in many cases, there are multiple certificates that are appropriate for a given um, course. 
So uh, we want you to really look at those closely. If you have any questions or if you know, if you finalize which courses exactly you're going to offer and, and you for some reason can't find those on the assignment rules, we'll be glad to help you and we may even consult with our, our friends in, in curriculum. And I know that there are some new courses coming forward over the next year or two that we don't have in our assignment rules yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll be working on getting those into the assignment rules. So it's really all in the course. Well, I and our courses. Of it because I'm part mm -hmm. of the master schedule. Right. So, so uh, but it's, it's a disconnect when you talk about from the HR department and saying, mm -hmm. well, it sounds good to say I'm marketing, I'm looking for a STEM teacher, or I'm actually looking for an engineering teacher. Mm -hmm. And to lock me on my, my position is always just, uh, well, you know, I'm fortunate to have an engineer who has retired who's working for our program now. Uh, but to attract another one or somebody who's going to be actually teaching engineering courses. Uh, you know, when, you, when we say it's a STEM designation, uh, I'm actually an engineering teacher. And so, you know, I, I've looked at the applicants so far, and nobody qualifies. Uh, for, you know, and I have 25 applicants because it was just posted this week. Uh, but there's nobody out there that's going to be qualified who will be able to get the approach from the certification standpoint. So, I guess. Well, and that may be that may be a situation where you might want to use a school district teaching permit. Um, it's a possibility if you do not have a certified teacher, but you have a highly experienced person that you might employ that particular um, avenue. Or, you know, on the assignment chart, as Carrie mentioned, um, and it was discussed earlier by Mr. Chapman, that you could go ahead and take your certified educators, put them in that role to teach those CTE areas, because when you think about it, you could have a sci health science technology, uh, health science teacher, and they could teach, of course, um, introduction or you know your your 101s or your medical terminology but if you have an LVN who's never had physiology which counts as a science credit would you want that person who's never had physiology teaching that to your students so employ those folks that are certified and use our assignment chart to say hey we don't have this health science person but we've got a math I mean we've got a science teacher we can use them. Go ahead and use that. So use that because it shows you all old and new certificates that, that can teach that course. Okay, so anything else? Any other questions about certification? Uh, one of the things that came up not too long ago is counting military experience for um, uh, credentialing, and uh, which I'm very happy about. But uh, one of the things that's on there is that we can count military experience toward the industry license. Is there any guidance on how many years we should be looking for on a military transcript to determine that license? It's, it's a little kind of vague in code. Um, that's a really great question. We had a lot of legislation that went through last session um, to assist in transitioning our military into the teaching profession, allowing exemption of fees, allowing uh, the acceptance of military experience as appropriate for the way journey experience and then um, the licensing part. That I am not familiar with yet in terms of transit, you know, uh, trading military experience for a license. So um, I need to get back with you on that okay. one. Um, I think our teacher preparation programs are probably working on that, but let me. That's us. <laughs> oh, which we're, program are you from? We're with Region 13. We're Region 13. Yeah. Oh, yay. Sure. Yeah, we're not sure how to yeah. like, interpret it right now. Yeah, and we may have to look at that on an individual basis sure. at first okay. because we haven't had a lot of. Um, experience with that yet. Okay. So um, I'd like to get back with you on that sure. one if I may. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good, yeah. Any other questions about certification? Um, I think we're really close to our timeline right at 930 so appreciate the opportunity to come out to you. We have our contact information here and um, give a round of applause to our, our ladies who some of these is their first time out.